what I'm more going to talk about is this project I'm working on with a number of other teams across Microsoft, not just on identity management, but on a whole big uh, spectrum of cybersecurity. What I'm going to be talking about is privilege access management for hybrid. And what do we mean by that? What we're looking at is the threat landscape. The threat landscape that involves highly privileged individuals in enterprise networks using enterprise applications. And as I'm sure you know from all the news, it's the administrators who are in some way involved in these attacks. And on-premises is where these attacks are today, but they're not limited there. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go into it. Now, let's start with the first question. Who has a Windows server in your environment? OK, good, good. Nice to see everyone's awake. Who has a Windows server in your environment that's domain joined and has not been patched in the last two months? Oh, um, well, let me just stop here and say, go patch it, come back. Because two months ago, we put out some pretty critical Kerberos updates. So if you haven't done so, if you don't have it on your plan for what to do when you get home on Monday, patch, do the critical security updates. There are actually really, really critical updates that went out last November. Uh, MS14065 for Kerberos, you really should go and look at that and put that on every domain joined Windows server. We even have it for down level. Yes, all the way to that old version of the Windows server. Go and patch that. Let me get start there. Why is this important? Well, it's important because I know that most of you haven't patched, although I was hoping for a better response. And the attackers know that people haven't patched. The attackers know what the networks look like. They do reconnaissance on the networks. They go to these conferences, well, maybe not this conference, but similar conferences, and they look to see what the threat landscape looks like. And they know that they can find some way, if they try hard enough, in order to somehow get into the network. They can try spear phishing. They can try social engineering. They can try to find some kind of backdoor. Maybe there's a software bug that hasn't been patched or that patch hasn't been deployed out there. The techniques keep changing. Techniques evolve. More generally, what we hear, though, is that there's this trend of attackers using Active Directory in some way. It could be that there's a bug in Active Directory. It could be that there's a bug that has nothing to do with Active Directory other than the attacker could look in Active Directory and find something interesting that would tell them where to go next or who the admins were or if there was an unpatched machine. A lot of data there, a lot of very valuable data. And as most of you have Active Directory that have been built up over the last 10, 12, 14 years, the volume of data that's in there is a gold mine to the attacker. They can look at that environment and they can say, are there vulnerabilities? Are there areas in which there could be potential exposure? Now, does this mean that Active Directory is inherently evil and we should turn it off and all go back to using flat files and uh, CC mail? No. There's a lot of value to there, but it's important to make sure you have the right protections in place. So that's what I'm going to be covering today. Most basic are things we do automatically as Microsoft, along with everyone else in the software community, is issue updates. So first, patch. The second reason why I'm talking about Active Directory and on-premises in what is notionally about cloud and Azure Active Directory and about using more and more of these cloud services is the on-premises environment is the foundation for authentication and authorization into the cloud as well. So if there is a compromise, where does that compromise start? It could start in the cloud, but oftentimes we've seen that they start in the on-premises environment. Why? One, there's a lot of valuable information probably still in the on-premises environment. There's your SAP system, there's finance, there's HR, all those systems that are probably the last ones to move to the cloud are on-prem. And the control of the cloud, again, starts on-premises. The accounts for the administrators of cloud services are on-premises accounts in Active Directory or in a file called password that has all the username and passwords of the cloud accounts. So you need to make sure that the on-premises systems are appropriately protected in order to protect against attacks in the cloud. The second thing to keep in mind is not just the external attackers, but for some organizations, there is a threat 
from inside as well. Again, this is going to depend upon your landscape, what kind of role your administrators are in. But there is certainly problems that we've seen in a number of customers about social engineering and about the power of an administrator. For most of you, you're probably not a, in an entirely IT-centric company like Microsoft is. At Microsoft, when I go talk to my colleagues, no matter what department they're in, they know a lot about computer security. We have training. We have signs in the hallway saying various things. In many other industries, IT is a little mysterious. And IT can ask you to do things, like ask you for your credentials. Oh, I need your password for this. Oh, yeah, you're from IT. You're an administrator. You must have a legitimate need for that. I don't know what it is, but it seems like a plausible sounding request. So another thing that we hear from customers is, Yes, my administrators need to get their job done. Yes, I can't get rid of all my administrators and replace them with robots and scripts and so on. But I need to make sure I know what are those administrators doing. I need to make sure I have the right controls in place so that they're only supposed to be administer, administrator for one part of my environment. They're not actually going out and doing things way outside of their control. Does this make sense? So what we want to do is make sure that our foundation for the cloud, our foundation for on-premises Windows Server, which is Active Directory, has the appropriate controls in place so that Active Directory does not become a vector for either an external or an internal attacker to grow and spread and track across all the enterprise assets. Because this is a timeline we got from one of our customers of an actual attack that caused significant amounts of financial loss. It was a very well planned, very well coordinated external attack. The attackers are highly sophisticated, but used a lot of off the shelf, commercially available to the attacker community tools. And once they got into the network, once they found a point, there's a number of ways they could do it, like finding an admin and getting them to run software, sending them spear phishing, using various elevation bugs that they might find in the operating system or in various applications. Once they get in, Getting to domain admin was too easy. And once you're a domain admin, then your abilities are limitless. You can control a lot of resources across the organization on any domain join machine. You can change anything you want in Active Directory. You can create backdoor accounts. You can manage the cloud services. You can do what you need to. So there's a lot of power here. And we want to make sure that that power is going to be used responsibly, so that you have the appropriate controls in place. You know who the administrators are. You can make sure that someone can't easily become an administrator if they're not allowed to. And you want to make sure that when someone is an administrator, that you know what they're doing, where they're going, what they have access to. Now, one of the ways in which we want to better protect Active Directory is really look at the problem of these attacks are going through Active Directory, and in particular through Active Directory administrators or other kind of highly privileged accounts to their ultimate target. Really, the attacker doesn't care about Active Directory. If you're going to a bank, or if you're going to attack an oil and gas company, if you're going to attack a government agency or a computer security firm, you're not really trying to take down their AD. You're trying to take down their oil pipelines, get at their financial systems, and so on. Active Directory is just a way in which the attacker learns about the network or tries to get privileges. So what we want to do is address that. We're making improvements in Windows, obviously, in related products, in our cloud services, so that Active Directory is no longer the path that the attacker can take so that the attacker has to do a lot, lot, lot more work in order to go and try to carry out an attack on an organization. One way we want to do that is really focus on who are the administrators? Why are there administrators in an organization? How many are there? And what can they do? It seems kind of obvious in, in retrospect to say, well, maybe we should have looked at administrators. But again, if we think back about the history, you know, how did Active Directory grow? is very much the same as pretty much any big deployed software application in a lot of organizations. It goes in for one application. Maybe it's files. Maybe it's Exchange. Something pulls us in. It has a lot of power associated with it. If someone's an admin, then what can they do? 
They can install software. They can manage computers. They can create accounts. They can reset passwords. But all the power is equal. So anyone who needs any one of those privileges gets the whole deck. And there's also the issue of human nature. People like to be helpful. That's one thing. Help desk has help in its name. So someone gets a new software product, they buy it at uh, Fry's or Best Buy, take it into the enterprise and say, I need the software product installed. I read the back of the box and said, must be administrator to install. Hmm, not administrator, I'll call up help desk. Help desk, make me an admin. Okay, I'll help you out, I will make you an admin. And by the way, when you're done with this, be sure to call help desk back and say, I don't need to be an admin anymore. Well, of course, doing the right thing, all of your employees and your companies will, of course, call back help desk a few days later and say, everything's installed, everything's working fine, here you go, IT, you can have your privileges back. But sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes people say, now I have a valuable asset. I have administrative privileges. So that the next time I need to install software, or someone on my team needs to install software, or I forget my password, or someone I need to do a favor for needs assistance, I'll have that, and I can help them rather than help desk. So there's a human nature aspect for administration that we find when we talk to organizations that has nothing to do with the technology. People get these privileges. You join IT, you become an administrator for a while, and then you decide, wow, this IT is not the role for me, I'm gonna go do some other job in the company. And as part of that, do you go and automatically take off all their permissions when they go and change roles and they take on a new role outside of IT? Hopefully, yes but I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand if you actually do that or not. So what we need to see is there's people who are administrators, maybe they don't actually need to be admins, or at least not admins 24 seven. Maybe they think they need to be admins, maybe there's a reason why they might need to be an admin for a particular task, so that's one area. Another issue we see is with the basic operating system. Now because this is an Active Directory, and identity management session. I'm not gonna talk about the OS, but I'm gonna give you some pointers to what we're doing at the OS level. And we also want to make sure, beyond controlling and understanding who are the admins, we know what they're doing. Are they actually acting in the way that we assume that they are? Maybe there's ways in which we can look at the administrator behavior and map it up to what we expect someone to be doing in say a help desk role or a software management role or an active director administrator role and see, do those privileges actually line up? So what's the first thing we're doing? The first thing we're doing, we've actually already done this, is address <coughs> the concern that customers have about attacks using active directory, what's called lateral movement, in order to take on administrative privileges. So if you have Windows servers in your environment, if you have active directory, take a look on TechNet for these features, protected users, remote admin mode, and the authentication policy silos. All this is out there already, it's already in the products, already in the operating system. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail other than just highlight what these capabilities are and why you should think about these before you even do anything else because you probably have this in your environment already. You can deploy this with AD. Protected users groups. If you have admins in your environment and you're saying, I'm concerned, I read about these things in Network World or other magazines about password sniffing or weak cryptography, you can just turn all that off. Put a user into the protected users group and then they can't log in with the weaker cryptography. So it's a pretty trivial operation. Take your admin account, put in group, crypto problem, no longer concern. Another thing, we're talking about how does someone become a admin if they're an attacker. And one way is to go and compromise the box. Well, how do you do that? One way would be you find someone in the organization who's not an attacker, ordinary end user, get them to install your malware. And your malware then causes their laptop, their desktop to go crazy. Screen flickering, skull and crossbones, crazy box, really strange. So what does the end user do when their box is acting crazy? They call up help desk, say help desk, something weird is going on in my box, I don't know what it is, but fix it. So help desk logs in the box and I, I don't know, this is way beyond what I can deal with. I'm gonna have to elevate this to my level three backend support. My level three backend support then remotes into that box. It says, okay, let me see what's going on here. They of course remote in as themselves. And of course, because they're level three support, they are a domain admin. You now have a domain admin on the compromised box and the attacker says, woohoo, I got what I wanted. So second feature, restricted admin mode for RDP. I don't know if you use RDP or if you 
are more Citrix fans, but if you do use RDP or if your coworkers in IT or help desk or service management use RDP, you should know about this flag. If you're going to log into some random box and someone said, please help me log into my box and look at it, use this flag and it stops your credentials from then being able to be stolen from that and used elsewhere. Just basic security hygiene. Last one, and most interesting from an Active Directory perspective. You probably have some back-end processes going on in your environment. You've got SQL Server, you've got FIM, you've got DirSync, you've got Azure Active Directory Sync. Various things are running on. These various accounts that they use. FIM runs as an account, AD-Sync runs as an account. Those accounts are tied to their back-end services. They probably run on two or three or certain you know, small set of boxes, well locked away in the data center. The only time those accounts should ever be used is from those applications. You or me should never be logged in as FIM or as the directory or as Azure Active Directory. That would be crazy for that to happen. So you should look at this policy silence feature. It's in Windows Server today. What that says is these accounts that are controlling your backend services can only ever log in from a well-known set of machines. So if you've got Azure Active Directory Sync running as a particular user, and it's only on two or three boxes, create a policy silo. It's really easy to do. You can do it with the uh, AD management tool. You can do it with PowerShell and say, if I ever see that account log in on someone's laptop, that should never happen. And you can either tell AD, throw an alert, you know, put an event event log, or just block the login. So there's some basic hygiene like these you can do today with basic Active Directory that's already, you know, already deployed, already out there as updates for Windows Server, and that is your first step along the way. Now, where do we go next? Well, that's about protecting what you know. You're, you can tell your administrators, use this flag. You can find your service accounts, put them into a policy silo. What we also find, as I mentioned earlier, is there's a lot of admins. People have those admin privileges. They called up and they said, I need to be admin, and they're an admin. There's probably some turnover. Now, who's been working on Active Directory since it was first deployed in your environment? Who started working on Active Directory that was already in place in your environment? Okay. So that means that there's some degree of turnover between people who are Active Directory administrators in 2010 or 2005 versus where they are today. And there's also probably people in other IT roles who took on directory admin privileges or SQL privileges or exchange privileges, and they rotate jobs. They take on new responsibilities. Maybe they get their permission cleaned up, maybe not. The first step is find who they are. And we called a number of customers. Some of you, I think, participated in those calls where you asked, tell me who your administrators are. Characterize your administrator environment for Active Directory or Azure AD or one of the other applications. And we got a very wide range of answers. It's, it's me or it's me and five other people, or 20 other people, or 200 other people, or at one school it was the entire senior class can reset the passwords of the entire freshman class, <laughs> and who knows what else they can do besides that. It's all across the board. And the worst answer, of course, is I don't know. There's no sense of they have control over that. There's a lot of things that we put into Active Directory, multi-forest support, you can be an admin through groups or nesting or delegation. I'll not mention all of them. And because of that, people have admin rights. They don't know if they need them. They're not sure if they need them. And the attackers can find those users and say, great, that's going to be my vector to take on more privileges. They're not going to go after the full-time hardcore AD admins. Why? Because the full-time hardcore AD admin is sophisticated enough to know that if something's looking wrong, they'll spot it right away and they say, ah, oh, my account is attacking. Is, uh, acting strangely, it's probably under attack. I'm gonna disable my own account until I get it sorted out. But someone who's not thinking of themselves as an admin is like, yeah, I don't know if I'm an admin. Hey, my account's acting strange on some machine I never log into. I'm not gonna even know it's going on. So it's those accounts that the attackers are looking for. So what can we do about this? We need to reduce the exposure of administration. So one of the features that we're putting in to Windows and into Identity Manager that my colleague Sharon mentioned earlier is reducing the number of permanent full-time administrators to the bare minimum. Because everyone else who said, oh yeah, I need to be an admin, if you tell them, all right, you don't need to be an admin anymore, 
what do they do? They'll complain, oh no, I, I need this for some purpose. I'm gonna escalate if you take it away. You know, you can't take someone's asset away. It's like saying, oh, you don't need your health plan or your vacation or your bonus anymore. They want to have that asset. Once you have that asset, you can't take the asset away. So you have to say, you're gonna get your asset, you're gonna get it differently. Yes, of course, you can still become an admin when you need to be an admin. And there'll be a process in place for you to take on and, and use your administrative powers. But you shouldn't be an admin 24-7, 365, just in case you might want to do some administration in the future for some unforeseen circumstance. The second thing is, just because you're an admin shouldn't mean you're an admin of everything. Domain admins and directory is incredibly powerful. You can do anything on any box that domain join unless you've gone in and scoped it down. So we want to look at how do we give people the right set of permissions? And then finally, monitoring. So what have we said in the past? We've said that there's best practices for securing Active Directory. Who has read the best practices for securing Active Directory? There's a link down at the bottom, AKMS slash ADBP. This is a really good document. And it's really good because I didn't write it. It was actually written by the team in Microsoft that run the Active Directory, and they really know what they're talking about, about running an Active Directory that has 100,000 users at scale under really, I would say, constant attack. The AD best practice calls out about a dozen really good guidelines for what it means to run a production secure Active Directory deployment. And two of the guidelines have been exactly what I said don't have permanent admins in highly privileged groups. What's a highly privileged group? Domain admins, highly privileged groups, schema admins, exchange of course, SQL, a lot of them have highly privileged groups. Groups where if you get into that group, you now have power not just on one computer or one application, across many dozens, hundreds of applications. So no permanent admins. And instead, best practice number eight, grant temporary membership. Now in the past, we've said, this is what you should do. And then in the implementation section of that document, it said, there are a number of third party products and or services that can help you with that. Are there still a number of third party products and or services? Yes, of course there are. There are many good products. Some of you in this very room work on those products and our services. But we also want to make sure that everyone who's moving to the cloud, everyone who has Active Directory, pretty much is at risk and is exposed. We want to make sure that there were capabilities for everyone. Everyone with Active Directory had someone available. Everyone who's moving and using our premium services had an option for how to deal with this if you didn't have anything today. So what we're providing in Windows Server and in the next version of Identity Manager, Microsoft Identity Manager, which is currently in CTP, is one of the features for privileged access management. How we provide this is control over the life cycle of the administrative accounts. So if you use them today, you know it does sync, it knows certificates, and it does self-service for groups and passwords and so on. And then one thing you do with them is you manage the life cycle of your employees. When an employee joins, see a record in HR, triggers an account in Active Directory, when they leave, account gets cleaned up, mailboxes get created, and so on. All well known, good, you've been doing this for years, no surprises here. You probably have though been using it for your broad user population, you know, all the people who are outside of the administrative environment. Here what we're suggesting is we're going to be adding some new capabilities specifically focused on those users with those accounts that have admin privileges. Why are we doing this in Windows Server? Well, because that's where Active Directory is. Why are we doing this in Identity Manager? Because Identity Manager has the workflow, the processing capabilities built in that enable you to decide and define the right policy for what we call just-in-time. The just-in-time model is everyone who doesn't need to be a hardcore 24-7 server or system or application administrator can take on admin rights quickly, easily, immediately when they need. And those admin rights expire automatically. So instead of that user calling up help desk and saying, I got the box, and the box said must be an admin, make me an admin, and the answer being, you're an admin permanently until you remember to call back and take your admin rights away, the answer is, you can request to be an admin. And if you're authorized to do so, you can become an admin immediately. But those rights go away after some time period, an hour, 
a day, a week, whatever makes sense for your organization. They're automatically garbage collected out of the directory so that those administrative rights disappear and the user is no longer an admin. Why is that important? Because let's say a week later, a month later, a year later, the attacker is probing around and sends that user a spear phishing email and says, oh, run this application. Here's a conference in your area about security. You might be interested to read about this. So you click the attachment, attachment has malware. The malware runs as an ordinary end user, not as an administrator. So this is the vulnerability that we're addressing with identity management and Windows Server is all those users who had admin privileges but weren't using them were exposed to malware, were exposed to spear phishing, were exposed to social engineering attack, trying to get those admin powers. Now we take them away so that when the user's not needing to be an admin, they don't have that. Clear? So how do we do this? As I mentioned before, we're using Identity Manager. Why are we using Identity Manager? Why aren't we building everything in the cloud? I thought everyone was supposed to be talking about cloud today. Why is Mark here talking about, about on-premises software? Is, is Alex going to run and take Mark away because he's not on the, on, on the cloud message? No, we're doing this on-premises for a number of reasons. One, because today, that's where the attacks are. Very tactically, we know that our customers have exposure, our customers are concerned, and our customers need to do something immediately with their on-premises environment in order to make sure that they're protected so that they have the right admins for administering the cloud. Secondly, many of our customers, including most of you in this room, are familiar with Identity Manager. And you know that with Identity Manager, you can bring in data from multiple sources. You can configure workflows. You can configure policies. We have partners here who can help you with that process if you don't know. And that can make sure that the process for how does someone become an administrator fits in with the way your business operates. And that's something that FIM already knows how to do. And in MIM, it's fairly straightforward. Now, how are we going to actually implement this with Identity Manager? It's in a technology preview. So at the end of the session, I'll show you where you can go and download and read up on this. But just very briefly, we're going to create an isolated environment, what we call a bastion environment, for doing the administration. Why are we doing this? It's because some of our customers may have already had their network been breached, and they didn't know about it. The attacker may have gone in at some point to their Active Directory, compromised it, created a backdoor, got a copy of the DIT, used one of a number of techniques to try to leave themselves a back door. And if you try to do the administration of the directory from a directory that's already been compromised, you've got a problem. So we're creating an isolated environment. Now, if you read up on the, the guidance we put with Identity Manager, we'll show you step-by-step -step how to do that. The benefit is you're starting then from a known good place for administration. You'll know who the admins are. You'll know what they're doing. Everything is logged when they become an admin, how they request. Everything goes to the event log. Everything is isolated environment, so you have better control over what's going on. It's also part of an all-up life cycle. So in addition to the JIT or just-in-time process for elevation, there's a life cycle for these admin accounts. So if Mark's normally in your corporate directory and his account gets disabled, he no longer has the ability to elevate. He no longer has the ability to manage on-prem or cloud applications. We build in the processes for that. We generate alerts. We generate events if things are out of the ordinary. Now, I mentioned MIM. And some of you are thinking, oh, you're going to tell me about that SharePoint portal thing. I have to go do that. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. We're adding some new interfaces, new ways of getting at the system. PowerShell is one. So if you look at the preview that's available for download, you'll see there's some new PowerShell commands. I can type new PAM request. I get elevated. Great, I'm ready to go. I can be an in in exchange administrator, an AD administrator within seconds. There's a new portal as well. Sharon showed you some of what this looked like yesterday. I'll just repeat it here. This will be coming in a future CTP. This isn't there today, but it'll be here in a couple weeks' time. And this is, again, a very simple interface based on REST that allows someone to go in and say, I need to take on an administrative role. I need to be an exchange admin, a directory admin. And I'll tell them, great, here's the account. It's an admin for a minute, an hour, a day, whatever makes sense for your organization. So why are we doing this? And how are we doing this is a little bit different from how some of the other products out there work today. So some of you may be familiar with products from CyberArk, from Lieberman, from Dell, from Request, from Psychotic, and so on. 
There's lots of products out there today, and they're very good products. I'm not to say, oh, you should stop using that or throw them away. What I'm saying is, first of all, these capabilities come as part of the environment that we provide. Identity Manager CALs are included as part of Azure Active Directory Premium. So if you're not using MimCal today, you don't have to go and buy MimCal separately. If you're using the premium services, you get the rights for this administrative account as part of Enterprise Mobility Suite or Azure Active Directory Premium. And Windows Server, of course, you already have. The second is the way in which we use Identity Manager to manipulate this is not through anything to do with passwords. Because if you've probably used a product like CyberArk or Lieberman or Dell or some of the others, a lot of these products work by password check-in, password check-out. And that's good for Unix, that's good for routers, that's good for systems that kind of have a password-based interface. But we also know that some companies, including Microsoft, where I have a smart card badge, or others of our customers, they don't like passwords. They've kind of moved off passwords seven or eight years ago. So we're not building a system that's based on passwords. Our approach for just-in-time is based on permissions. We put a user into a group. We elevate them into an appropriate role that gives that account access. And then we take that account out at the end of the period. That's different because we don't care how the user authenticates. They could authenticate with a password plus multi-factor authentication. Say we call their office phone to make sure that they're really sitting at their desk when they elevate. That would be much more secure than just a password by itself. Or they use smart cards or virtual smart cards or any of the new types of credentials that are becoming down the road in future versions of Windows or phones and so on. And finally, because we're using the framework that's already exists in Identity Manager, everything that you know how to do with workflows, with reporting, with customization is already there. So if you say, well, we need to customize how the solution works in order to be able to deploy it quickly, you can do that with Identity Manager. It's the same process as what you've seen in the past. The final thing I want to mention about this as well is you can deploy the solution without having to go back and upgrade your domain controllers. So if you've looked at our CTP, if you've looked at the MIM CTP, you'll see that there's a new version of Windows Server out there. That's just for the administrative accounts. The rest of the accounts, where all the applications reside, where your Exchange server is, where your other 80,000 or 100,000 or more users live, can stay in whatever version of Active Directory it needs to. If you need to keep it at 2003, 2008 for the next five, 10 years, that's fine. You can still manage it there as well. And you can deploy this incrementally. You take what groups are most sensitive. Directory admins, domain admins, exchange admins, administration of cloud applications, probably start with those, migrate those groups, pick a few users, start the process gradually. So you can roll this out very quickly over a period of time without having any big bang event where you know, suddenly everyone has to change. So that's the first step. Does that make sense? And everything I said there is either in preview today with the one exception of the uh, new portal interface I showed to be coming in preview shortly. So you can try this out when you get home. We have pre-built VMs for all of this. Question? Yeah, so is the expectation that we can take our FIM, upgrade to MIM, and enable this capability, or is the better model a MIM server dedicated to this function? That is a great question. The trust model. Yeah, that's a great question. Should I take the FIM? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to repeat that question, which is so good, I'm going to say it again. Should I take the FIM I currently have, upgrade to MIM, and start doing the administration of the accounts from there, or should I have it be separate? There you go. What I would recommend is take the FIM you have, upgrade it to MIM at the right time for those scenarios. If you're currently using FIM for sync and you don't need to upgrade for a week or two, Plan out the right time for that. Separately, set up MIM specifically for this administration. Why? You can do it more quickly. If it's only doing one thing, if it's only managing the admin accounts, it's probably going to be a much easier deployment for that. <laughs> Secondly, you also use the magic word trust, which is if you don't know the health of your current Active Directory environment, would I start building my new administration onto a computer that's domain joined into that environment or would I say, maybe I should start from a clean slate, from an environment where I'm going to build up the foundation of trust, bring the accounts into that one at a time, and use that to administer my existing environment. That way, if there was a back door, that attacker isn't waiting to say, OK, they installed the minute. Oh, he installed me. OK, I'll go infect that. And you're loaded right away. So that's why we recommend 
Do it as a separate MIM. You can do it more quickly, and you can have it be an isolated environment. You can still manage your apps in your existing forest, though. Which way is the trust going? So the question is, which way do we have trust? We have two different trusts between the environments. We have one trust to allow Identity Manager and Active Directory to tell your existing applications, here's Mark and he's an admin for your application. You can trust it because I'm the new trustworthy for this. We also have a limited trust going in the opposite direction so that a user can make a request in and say, I would like to request to be an admin. But they're two different kinds of trust. It's not equal. Okay. And where does MIM need to sit? MIM needs to sit in the new trustworthy environment because it now has the crown jewels for administration. So that portal couldn't support the existing workload of all users if we didn't allow all users into the limited trust. And your last question on that was, if I were trying to use that, would I use that same system for administering all my existing functions like self-service password reset? You probably wouldn't want to do that. You'd want to use this as a separate system for administrating only and and user self-service is what you do either with taking FIM to MIM or FIM to Azure Active Directory Premium, however you want to do it for the rest of the user community. This, this was very helpful. This, this cleared up deep confusion on my part from the CTPs. Okay. Great. And we can do a lot more. So if you have any more questions on that, come grab me afterwards at the next session. I can tell you a lot more detail also about where we're going with that. But I did want to talk about some of the other features here. So we talked about the just-in-time administration. I did want to highlight a few other important things. So we talked a little bit about credentials. Who, now let's talk cloud for a moment. Who has used Azure multi-factor authentication for an administrator account? Who has registered an administrator account for multi-factor authentication? Okay, so the first thing, what is the first thing I told you to do? Patch your Windows Server. Second thing you want to do, for your administrator accounts in Azure Active Directory, register your admins for multi-factor authentication. Do that today. You don't need to turn it on and leave it on. Just, oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to slow me down after the phone call. Make sure they register. Why? Because when the breach happens, that is not when you want to be registering people, saying, well, what was your phone number again? Are you really the user? Register them now. Get it out of the way. Get them everyone registered for Roger multi-factor authentication. Turn it on. Have them do one thing. Make sure it works. They get the phone call, office phone, mobile phone, whatever, mobile app. Then you can turn it back off or, or leave it on if you want to. If you're an office admin, leave it on. But make sure they register now. So that's the second takeaway. Why do you want to do that? Because when they get that breach and the attacker goes there, it's like, oh, welcome. You can now register. The attacker says, oh, I have this mobile phone number. As it happens, I will register myself. You now have a mobile phone number of a burner phone in China, which may or may not be useful, but it definitely will lock out the real admin. So now that you've done that, now that you've registered your admin for multi-factor authentication, you've said, wow, when I'm using Azure Active Directory and Office 365, there's a lot of power. If I'm a global admin in Office 365, I can do pretty much anything across any apps, across Office, Exchange Online. That may be too much power. So we've put a feature, it's currently in preview, called administrative units. And what this does is scope down what the administrators can do in the cloud. So let's say you've got you know, help desk staff and they work on a region by region basis. You've got US, EMEA, AsiaPAC, and so on. If you put them all as global admins, then great, they can be very helpful. They can change anyone's password of anyone in the company, but maybe that's not what the policy you want. Maybe you want to say people in help desk in EMEA can reset the password of anyone in EMEA who isn't an uh, administrator or other help desk staff, because then it would get a little confusing if one of them goes, goes rogue or gets attacked and then resets everyone's password. So with admin units, which you currently have in preview and PowerShell, you can start scoping down the capabilities for administration across the cloud services. So this is our first start to building out more and richer administration capabilities in the Azure Active Directory environment, as well as what we're delivering today or in previews on-premises. Has anyone tried the admin unit so far? Pretty new, so maybe you haven't seen one. So this is something we're going to keep building out. We're going to be building out more user interface, more capabilities around this area. So keep watching these previews. The other thing that I'm really excited about is the role-based access control for Azure. So if you've used Azure and Active Directory, you probably noticed in the past something a little bit interesting. Your Active Directory administrators are application administrators and vice versa. 
which because if someone's creating a lot of applications, you know, resources, VMs, websites, they probably have called up and said, hey, in order to really, really use the power of Azure, I'd like to be a directory admin because then I get to see everything. I see all the settings, I get to make configurations. And we know that in some environments like our own, we have way too many administrators in our Active Directory because they're administrating one or more of these cloud applications, Azure apps, Azure connected apps, SaaS apps, and so on. So just like we want to partition who can administer across different user communities, as I showed in the previous slide, we also want to partition based on what people can do with Azure connected resources. So in our new portal for Azure, portal.azure.com, you'll see that there's now finer grained authorization for the resources. So if you have a virtual machine or a website or other things in Azure, then it's not the case, well, anyone who's an admin is an admin. You can now go fine grained. You can say, people in this security group, they are able to monitor any Azure resource. To put people in a group, they have read access across everything. So you have a lot more flexibility here. We're going to be adding more capabilities. We're going to be adding a lot more features here. We're going to be opening up these APIs if you're building your own apps in the cloud, either on our stack or elsewhere stacks. You want to use this authorization model, this is going to be opening up in the future. So watch this preview as well. There's going to be some new capabilities here. So what do I want you to do? Patch, register for MFA. More practically, what do you do? Patch. If you're concerned about pass the hash, if you're concerned about all those things you read about in the press about Golden Ticket and the Sony breach and Target and so on, there is a white paper on what we're doing around the pass the hash. We have some new technologies that Alex Simons mentioned earlier today that are also going to be protecting in the on-premise environment. There's going to be some news about that, probably at an appropriate time. Not much I can say about it today from a technology perspective, but watch these white papers. We talked a minute or two about the CTP. So he said, this sounds interesting. I want to know what it's going to look like. You can download this. There's a VM. You go to the Connect site. If you've been working on Forefront Identity Manager or Sync or Azure Active Directory Sync for a while, you'll say, Site 433 sounds very familiar. It's, it's actually the same place where FIMR2 did its previews. FIM did it. And you can download the VMs of what we talked about here. So everything's all set up. You can install it on Hyper-V or wherever you want to run it. Try out some elevations, try out the new PowerShell. We're going to keep refreshing this as we get closer and closer to the MIM uh, general availability date. And then finally, you can get an Azure subscription and the cloud capabilities. They're in preview today, but they're really powerful. And I suggest keep watching Alex's blog, keep watching the preview and the preview portal, because there's going to be a lot of new features rolling out there in parallel to what we're doing on-premises over, I would say, the next couple months. And with that, I'd like to thank you. I know we've got a short time, so if you have any questions, you can come grab me afterwards.